that I selected middle grades because we can do disciplinary literacy at all levels. But I selected 4A because from there, any lesson that we look at, you can go up or down by simplifying it for a younger grade, making it age appropriate, or making it more complex and more appropriate for older students. So we're going to start looking at that. And this is a demonstration lesson for pre service teachers. Okay. The agenda for this. Previously, it was called content reading. And the idea behind that was we were focusing on literacy in math, literacy in science, literacy in social studies, literacy in language arts, and then we kind of stretched it and said, and in the other areas, the special subjects, whether it's art, music, PE, other fields as well. Um, research came about that looked at this and said, we really want to look at disciplinary literacy and focusing on not reading in that content, but special expert thinking, reading appropriate to your discipline. And so it started the shift of just saying, okay, well, we don't do reading like children's books in math class. That was kind of a misnomer about it. And so when we start looking at disciplinary literacy, we're saying, okay, so what kind of literacy supports your field as an expert? and uh, then what types of strategies would be appropriate to support those types of literacy for that field. Um, it's also, again, field specific, and this is a really good way to use this course to help pre-service teachers, regardless of their background, to understand how they can relate literacy into their courses, into their field that they're working. This is necessary because in the EC6, they get lots of new courses. They have at least four reading courses by the time they graduate with that degree. But our 4-8 uh, students have like three reading courses, and secondary, this is their only one. Without it, they wouldn't have any reading expert, uh, expertise unless they were an English major. So this is a necessary course for that. Some examples up here of how you could use disciplinary literacy with science is uh, working on experiments, taking notes, field notes, uh, and also analyzing research that's been done, case studies, things like that, and going in and writing up those things. So it's evaluative, it's documentary, and things like that. Uh, math, they can do math journaling. We see this a lot of times in the elementary grades, but they can be used in the upper grades as well. Because a lot of times students will make errors in their math and skip things. And this can make them slow down and analyze the process that they're going through to actually solve a problem by taking note of the stages. And there's other ways that they can use writing to then also connect math into real life experiences. And then with PE, we could do it to journal monitoring physical fitness. And there would be other ways, but that's the most obvious way that students can do that. Also in health courses, they can do where they keep a record of the food that they consumed and calories or the amount of time they would need to exercise to burn something off. So again, literacy covers all different fields. Integrating standards. For our model lesson today, we're going to be looking at the topic of child labor in America, specifically in the 19th century, so basically the early 1900s. <clears throat> With this topic, we're going to be pulling in strands, uh, standards from language arts as well as social studies. There's going to be at least three TEKS for, uh, and this is from the 4-8, three TEKS for language arts and one for social studies. There could be a lot more, but these are the ones that primarily would relate to what we're doing today. The first one is uh, talking about providing instruction and comprehension skills that will support students' transition from learning to read to learning from reading or reading to learn. And so with this would be any of the strategies that a teacher uses that helps the student to get at the information in a passage that they're reading and pull out information from that to use. Uh, so that's going to be what we'll do with that, st uh, that standard. The next one is providing students varied and meaningful opportunities to learn, use, study, and um, use the inquiry skills to recognize the importance of using these skills and to enhance their achievement across curriculum. Inquiry is the process of where we ask questions about something and we explore it to learn and understand it. So it's a using process. Um, and in this case, working with different types of media to get information to broaden our understanding of a topic, particularly one that we don't necessarily have a personal experience with, that would be going through an inquiry process. And so any of that critical thinking and the skills that we're engaging in in that process 
would relate to this standard. The next one is to evaluate visual images, which obviously we're using photographs, historical images, we're doing that. Um, and also to represent meaning and that the students are provide varied opportunities to analyze and interpret the images. And there's going to be a specific tool that we will use to help get at analyzing the photographs. And it's very important when we're working with students not to say, okay, look at this picture and what do you notice in it? And just have them talk because they don't have a lot of expertise to really go in depth. And so they're going to talk about more superficial things. So if you give them a structure to use to pull that information out, you're going to be more consistent in the learning and the results that they're going to get from that process. So there's going to actually be two structures that we'll use, and these are the strategies that we're going to be using. One is to um, analyze a photographic document, and the other one is a strategy called Soapstone that helps you to get in and analyze information out of a primary source. The next one is the social studies standard, and this is applying higher order thinking skills to locate, analyze, evaluate, interpret, organize, and use information related to citizenship issues. And this is a citizenship issue when we talk about how children were being used in the workforce and the impact that it was having on them and on their families. And so we're going to look at that, and they're going to be doing it through a variety of primary and secondary sources as well as electronic. Historical photo, and what this does in the lesson is it provides an introductory hook and it activates prior knowledge so that it gets the students ready to learn. So, by showing them that visual image, they may not know much about the topic of child labor, but they're already going to start relating to it. And at a human level, emotionally, there's going to be a connection as well. Analysis of primary and secondary documents this is something that's very important and it's expert uh, thinking that happens in the field of social studies and history when we look at those primary documents. A primary document is something that is from that time period that is written, okay? Reality and artifacts that are visuals, things that we can touch or see, um, like a vase or something that would be from that time period, that would be an artifact. But a primary document, something that's written, a telegram, a letter, a journal, those types of things are primary documents. Secondary documents are filtered. They're filtered because they are written by someone else about a person from that time period. They could be an interview of a person who had been there in the past, but it's filtered and so it's not going to be that person's personal narration of like a recording at the time of what they happened or a recording of a speech, okay? So we're gonna be looking at those types of things and that's going to promote our literacy and also have the critical thinking. We're going to work in collaborative groups because this method of, uh, supports students. It's a great way to do differentiated instruction because, and to support our special ed and our ESL students because when we have that collaboration, there's the peer support. We're talking at a level that our peer understands. We've also more recently learned the information, and so it's easier for us to explain it to a peer sometimes than the teacher. Even though the teacher has the best intentions, sometimes they can't get through to every student. And so a peer can be a great way to do that. Also, with our native learners, um, when they have the peer support, this younger generation of learning, when they have the peer support, they're more willing to take a risk in their learning than they are if they're having to do it out in front of everyone and in front of the teacher. So that's a great strategy. Jigsaw is when we work in groups and then we re, uh, restructure those groups and merge them so that they're sharing their learning across. This is effective because it promotes accountability of learning. It sets a purpose that you need to pay attention right now and participate right now because you're going to have to do something with this following. And so it has that accountability and that expert sharing of knowledge promotes community in the classroom because we're bringing something to our peers, they're bringing something to us. And so that, that supports the student-centered classroom. And then reflection is what we're gonna be doing toward closure and this is where we take our learning and we think about what we did and what we learned, which then also helps us to process it more effectively into our short-term memory. And then from that, that helps us to connect and retain it to things that we already know, so we're more likely to retain it longer. So reflection is a necessary step, and it's a process that students themselves have to engage in. It's a process of making meaning and recognizing what they learned, okay? So that's our process of things that we're gonna work on today in the lesson. Our lesson today will be on child labor in America. Again, this is from the early 1900s. Um, the introductory hook we're going to look at a primary source photo, and we're going to talk about things, and I'm going to model this with you and then invite you to participate in it with me.
but modeling, talking about what types of things are noticed in the picture. going to look at this. And I have two pictures side by side. This is of a boy that's heading off to work in the mines. And this is a, at the end of the day what that child might look like. Again, obviously two different boys. You see him heading out to work. He's taking his lunch pail. He's got a pipe in his mouth. He's carrying a pickaxe, which is a heavy tool. Um, he's got his light up on his head so that he can see when he's in the mines. And he would be heading off and probably putting in a 12-hour day. So this is heading off in the day. This is at the end of the day. You can see the soot on his face from having worked in the mines all day. And then also he has a slightly different style of light. <coughs> uh, they had some back then that actually had an open flame in them. And this is what they would wear on their heads so that they could see when they were working. So from looking at these pictures, Things that I want to notice is, you know, the things I see very obviously in the picture. And I can go into details of what's around him, like the fact that his sidewalk is made out of boards. And so that would tell me a little bit about perhaps the economic level of the family. And then the fact that he's dressed and heading off to work almost like a man heading off to work for the day, but clearly he's not a man. And the way he's having to carry this heavy tool, but yet, He's smoking a pipe like a man, and so that tells me something about how he's being treated and the expectation on him as a child for his age. And then the end of the day, while he looks pretty chipper heading off here, freshly rested, he's absolutely worn out here. He's put in a full day at work, not in the classroom, and there's no way at this time of the day that he could go into a classroom and do any learning. So we've got this contrast between the images but again, just the angle of the shoulders and the expression in the face, utter exhaustion. So the work he's doing is very tiring for a child. <clears throat> what do I think when I look at this? For me, if I just saw this image, I might think it was posed. I might think it was him role playing his father. If I didn't know any better, I might think that that's the situation. But when I come over here and I see at the end of the day, I realized, no, this is his reality. He's heading off to work. So things that I would think about that is how unfortunate it is that a child of this age, 10, 11, 12, is putting in a full day of labor, hard physical labor. And the fact he's missing out on a childhood, he's missing out on an education that's going to allow him to make more money later. And I know that the fact that he does this type of work is very dangerous between cave-ins and things like that. His life is at risk in this job. There's high risk. And I also know uh, that from my own prior knowledge, that they had a, a thing called black lung that was a result of being exposed to working in the mines all the time that would kill them at a very young age. So when I think about this, I feel very sad for this child that his life is basically locked into this path. And this is what his, his whole future is going to be. What I wonder about it, is if there was any way that his family could get out of this circumstance. That makes so I'm not going to judge the families for their situation, but I do wonder about their situation and what else could happen, what else could be done differently, okay? <clears throat> so we just went through looking at, as an introductory hook, looking at a primary image, me modeling how to go through and do analysis, and then what I'm going to have you do is you're going to work in two groups. So I would like to have a group of three to four over here and a group of four over here. If we could maybe have a couple of you guys shift into this group, that we will have the exercise sports science blended in with some of the edu uh, education students. And what I have for you in your group is you have a form that you can collaborate on that's going to be the analysis of the uh, photographic images that you guys have. And then you have three photographic images on paper. And the two groups are going to have different images. But you're going to have photographic images. On most of them, they will also have in the blue box a little bit of detail about the, the photographer and the source of the image or what's happening. Because sometimes you can't tell. We don't have the knowledge to look at it and go, oh, they're shucking you know, shellfish. 
Um, so you need to be able to have that information to help you process it. And you can choose just one of these images if you want, and as a group work together and collaborate on going through the analysis and jotting down your ideas. Or if you want, you can work within your group and analyze two or three different ones. But I'm just going to give you probably about three or four minutes to go through and do that analysis. Okay? And then after that, we're going to split the two groups and merge them so that you'll have half each in one group and half each in another group so that then you can share what you found in your group separate analysis. Okay? So that's the first half of what we're going to do right now. And so I'm going to go ahead and set these out for the groups. Don't worry about the articles behind. I'm going to go ahead and give you all of your materials right now. But right now you're just going to work with the, the top set of pages. Okay? Any questions? agree and work on just one photo if you want. Or you can work on two separate ones. No, uh, those are berries. But, and I couldn't find the, the additional information about this, but what was striking to me was just the size of the child that was doing this. I mean, he's like five or six.
picture like that you analyzed? And what did you find? What were your noticing? And what were you thinking and feeling about that? And then listen to the other group talk about theirs. And then any final consensus of what this has taught you so far on the topic of child labor, okay? So you're going to share out from each group and then pull it back together for what has this together brought you to understand about child labor so far, okay? So about two minutes right now. No, same thing, you're sharing what your group did with the other group and they're sharing theirs with you. Cool, well, ours is a, uh, figured that these kids were uh, they were harvesting some type of crop and uh, and we kind of figured that it was some type of like a migrant family maybe maybe that was mom overlooking her family one also wondering about the is this is this all they have for education like if, if there were any type of school that, that the young uh, the young attended and uh, also at what age when would this this infant have to start working and all that stuff and uh, the thing about what I felt was just, it just doesn't seem fun. I mean, it's like, what we had wondered about was family. We were wondering if it's just a family business. I think it would all start. But they were fairly huge. Somebody asked if they had specific assignments. And I was shocked they went to school. It was a full family experience. There were three or four children harvesting along with a man we assumed to be the father and then the mom standing behind him. Like they hold in the dishes, uh, and then in the background you can see quite a few more people. Mm -hmm. So we, what we thought was that it was probably several migrant families that were looking along and the harvesting the crop here. So kind of one of the things we were wearing is, yeah, is as migrant families are they moving yeah. together? Or are they at night yeah. living together, moving together? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there yeah. any sort of educational opportunity uh, for those children? teaching them something at night, obviously they're learning during the day about the crops, but is there anything beyond that? Mm -hmm. um, and then seeing the mom holding the infant at what age did the infant mm -hmm. start? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, here she's school. Mm -hmm. uh, why would she start walking? Mm -hmm. Did you want to do a synthesis of what you guys found from your discussion? Then you can jot that down there and we're going to talk about it. I'm sorry for the reference for children who had to live in life. want you to put a synthesis statement of what you found just at the bottom of that and let's talk about what you found what you've learned so far about child labor just from going through this process and analyzing the photographs so anyone with ideas it was rough I mean it really at an age like it didn't start at like eight obviously before we seen our picture it just started at I mean isn't that considered toddler four to six is toddler right you know? yes so, I mean, yeah, it's toddler and doing my work is, I mean, that's, that's rough. And so we saw in a lot of the pictures there was even infants. So they were having to be there. Why? Why were the infants there? Because the mothers were there and there's not child care. They can't afford child care. So the baby's going to be there, which then reduces the amount of work that the mother's doing, but she's still there working and supervising the other children. What else did you learn about the child labor? Every child was working, right? So every able child worked in families so that was like over exceeding them, like physically, mentally. Imagine. So it was very exhausting work physically and mentally for all of them. And also obviously working conditions were not always safe either. Right. So there was physical injury that was at risk also. Good. So we're gonna learn some more about this by looking at your article. So if you would each group has their own article, and you can stay where you're at for now because this will allow us working with some new people, and then we'll come back together in a little bit. So you can each have your own copy of your article. One of the articles, <clears throat> the one about the cotton dress, is first person about a child's experience learning about the process of cotton being developed <coughs> and the child labor involved. And then the other one over here is more biographical, and it's about a person who went into doing photography to document child labor and to kind of make a social statement about it. So you have information about him, and then there's also a piece at the very back that's from a contemporary blog of different experts that were looking at his impact 
on our country at that time. And so there's specifically a quote from one of those contributors that was a researcher. So I want you to go through and I want you to read your article. And then the process that I want you to go through to analyze your article is if you can look at the back of your analysis page, the one you've already written on. The strategy that we're going to use is called soap tone. a good one to use when you're analyzing a primary document, whether it's textual or even more of an image like a map with some text with it. <clears throat> when we look at this, S is going to be what is the subject of the piece. So it's going in, it's giving the students a structure to help them analyze so that they don't miss something that can be an important piece of information that can affect their whole understanding of that source. So what is the subject? Um, and what ideas or topics does it relate to? What is the occasion, the time, place, setting for it? Who is the audience? So who is this being written to? Um, and who is it directed at? What's the purpose or the reason for why the document was written? Who is the speaker and what voice do they use to tell the story? What is the tone of the piece? And this goes into emotional, attitudinal characteristics and um, where they're present in the document. So you're going to go through and just jot some notes. If you need additional writing space, you have some notebook paper that you can use uh, within your group. And so I want you just to worry about doing the substone at the top. Okay? There's some additional things at the bottom that would guide us if we were wanting to create questions on different levels. And this would tie into like Bloom's taxonomy of critical thinking. We're not going to worry about that right now. So right now, I just want you to focus in on responding after you read your article. Respond on the substone analysis. And you can choose to read it silently. You can choose to read it aloud. You can take turns reading. But I'm going to give you like at least five minutes right now for you to read through and begin doing the substone. At that point, I'll see if you are far enough into it or if you need a little bit more time. Okay. starting to fill out the soapstone analysis and you can collaborate during that <coughs> go through individually and then start collaborating but at some point we should start hearing the group discuss because that's going to help you to flush out your ideas and to even consider some things that maybe you missed or someone else in your group got so it's a chance for you to catch that up which is why a really collaborative approach is very effective okay so noise is okay Therefore, we're going to see differences on purpose. What is the purpose of the girl's narration? Education on the dress process, the cotton dress process. And, and that shifted her thinking about the rights of children and the, the value of what she has that they don't have. Okay? What is your purpose over here? 
I just I'll put to inform uh, about the past and uh, the little sign and his contribution to that change in the law. Good. All right. And what is the tone of your piece? I felt like she was surprised. So it was very personalized, her response to it, okay? What about over here? The tone? The tone. It started with respectful, and then I think you said it could be academic as well. Okay, did you have another part of tone with that? It's harder because it's not that narration. When it's a personal narration, the tone is gonna be much more human than when it's something that's more of a published piece. So this being biographical, there's going to be a different tone. Now, there would be a contrast between the blog and the bi biographical part because the biographical part we talked about had less bias in it. Not to say we could not find bias, but with the blog, there was more of those words of we should value what Lewis Hines' contribution is. So those types of words are already showing that there's a personal bias in it. So you had a bit of a split on that, but definitely academic and very respectful and informing would be what it was doing. Okay, so in looking at this, how did this take your understanding of child labor even further than what we had done from the photo analysis? Where have we gone now beyond that initial photo analysis? There more details. How so? My from personal experiences. Okay, so now we're taking it more of where it's not just an event from the past, a topic from the past. It's more down to a specific human level of personal experience of those people. And so we can see inside them to those feelings and the conflicts or their opinions. Okay, good. What about over here? I think we were able to see what led up to and when the change took place uh, in child labor laws. Okay, and he directly had an impact on that from his life's work. So now let's talk about why use two different styles of writing. We have first person narrative, very much primary source. We have a secondary source of where it's biographical and more of an academic piece. Why would we with uh, students want to use more than one style of writing? Some, some ways you can make your stuff very factual versus uh, another way. So and so if we go away from just factual, <laughs> how particularly when we're talking about the past, okay, because we're blending language arts and social studies in this lesson, how is that going to help the students to learn? Or maybe we should back it up. What's a barrier for them learning about the past? They can't relate. It's not in their experience. Or something that was a, a social issue or an opinion, you know, propaganda that's put out there from the past is not relevant now in terms of it's not something that is the same opinion held now. So they can't relate. There's a lack of relevance. There's a disconnect between now and then. So when we take pieces that are autobiographical or biographical, very factual, academic, that's not very far removed from a textbook, which is facts. But when we bring in more personalized pieces and we bring in the images, then we add more to the, what the students can learn. So how does this now change? Because this gets to our reason of why would we want to use more than one type of source? How does it change when we bring in a more human element? I mean, you can you can feel their tone. You can you can feel what they're what they're going through. Feel what they're saying. It becomes more personal, and so if before it was, it wasn't relevant, there was that disconnect, now, it, now it's relatable, because the exact event could be different, but the human part is the same. The struggle, the choices, the sacrifice, right? The challenges, the barriers, the cost that if we do this, then this is what's going to so that's why it's relevant to look at more than one source of information because it helps the students to gain relevancy. And it also takes it away from just facts because a lot of times when they're reading in terms of literacy, when they're reading and it's just informational text that is in a more of a textbook format or an encyclopedia format, that structure sometimes 
he is harder for them to make connections to and to therefore retrieve information. So even though we have the advantage of using a structure or a tool to help them to do the analysis, if we also give, bring in sources that have more of that human relevancy, it helps them to get into the topic even further, okay? What I would like you to do is find a place on your paper, and I want you just to write a final <coughs> thought, final statement. This is kind of your reflective statement at the end. I want you to think about what you now know about child labor. And you can just do it as focusing on factually, you know, this is what I knew about it to start with, and now I know this. You can also bring in, if you want, part of what that process was for you that helped you to learn that. Okay? But I want just a synthesis of what you've learned so far on child labor. As you finish that thought, I'm going to add one more thing that ties back into our discussion we just had. Why is this topic relevant to you now? We started out talking about then and now, and that disconnect between. But as we look at all the different reading and the thinking and the discussing that we've done today, how is this topic still relevant, and how is it relevant to you? Child labor was a major issue that caused many children to miss their childhood and educational experiences. Forcing children to work like adults took away from their youth and how they learned. Uh, this makes me appreciative of what we have today in the United States for our youth. However, child labor is still a large uh, country. Yes, and there we see the relevant connection, the connection to the world now, that it's still an issue. Okay, one more person. Child, I mean, I wrote down child labor is a little bit different from what I remember uh, learning it from grade school. Uh, it was a quick lesson that we, we got when I was back in, uh, back in my young ages, but um, the age of the children working was never seen by me. I mean, I never noticed it, and I never really realized that, you know, the age of three and four years old was what was actually working back then. I thought it was, you know, uh, your 10-year-old and stuff like that, and that's what, kind of, that's what kind of threw me off. That's what I learned today on reading these articles. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to wrap up is we want to look at how can we extend this, because we did a few different strategies, but as we're designing instruction, specifically today we're talking about disciplinary literacy, but as you're designing instruction, there's a choice of methods that you can use. And so we could do KWL, that's been making a resurgence again, particularly in higher ed, and we're familiar with that. Um, at least most of you should be, so quick recap if you're not. Start with, so it's a, a pre, activity and then a post activity. So the pre, the K, what do you know? So this is prior knowledge. What do you already know about the topic? And so at the very beginning, I could have started us with a brainstorm of what do you know about child labor? And any ideas that you came, would have been, came up with would have been put there. W, um, what do you want to know? And these are usually posed in the form of a question. And so that would happen before our learning and our activity. And then following it, L, what did you learn? And so that's that reflective piece. So again, it structures a lot along the lines of what we already did with the activity. KWL versus another strategy. It's just choice of good, better, best for our method. Uh, inquiry. Those of you who are not familiar with inquiry, this is kind of scientific, you know, method of where you're going through and you're posing, and they they have it for social studies as well. Um, and there's a couple of different models out there for inquiry, but basically you're posing a question. You start out with a basic knowledge, establishing what's the common basic knowledge that we have on the topic of child labor in this case, and then allow students to have some questions of things they would be interested in knowing more about, and then choose a particular one that they want to focus in on. And from that, they might work individually or in small groups to do further research and dig deeper into the topic. And so this is going to take more than one class period, but they would dig deeper into finding answers for their specific questions. Then they would bring that back into the classroom. And you saw in the lesson today, we were talking about having that accountability and that expert share of bringing things back and how that supports a student-centered classroom approach, approach collaboration, as well as just the accountability for their learning. And so inquiry would take them through that discovery process. It's facilitated by the teacher, but not dictated the entire way by the teacher. 
stay and stray, which is a lot like jigsaw, which would be, we did kind of do jigsaw with the first one with the photo analysis when we sh split our groups across. Um, stay and stray would be kind of a, a similar model, except that they would constantly rotate through and then they would start another round. Sometimes you may have seen that as kind of a gallery walk approach, similar thing. I think pair share is right there with your neighbor, turn and talk about what you just read or turn and talk about what we just learned about. So it's a way that's less disruptive for the entire class, but it engages the student. And the reason that we want to engage the student is that their motivation and their attention is greater uh, about the topic. They're less passive because they're being pulled into a role to participate with the learning. Um, so what would be some additional ideas? Because these would be some other methods we can do. Can you think of any additionals that maybe you've experienced in another class that you could also have done with this same lesson? I know I had a lot of them this morning. I was kind of going. Um, there's also ones where you could uh, construct questions. And so even on the back of the handout where it had those three different levels of questions, their level being much more open-ended, the first level being much more uh, specific and structured. So it was on the bottom of Soapstone, level one questions. And so you could do um, a, a questioning where you're doing a directed think and questioning activity. Um, level one, they're answered directly from facts from the text. Level two would require a little bit of analysis and interpretation. And level three, open-ended going beyond the text, which would be like where I said, and how is this relevant still? How is this topic still relevant? That's very open-ended. So you could do where the students are at some stage in the lesson stopping and constructing a particular level of question. And you could pair that level of question for like early on with the first the photo analysis, we could do a level one question. Then as we get into the analysis of the article, we could take them into a level two, and now toward the end of our lesson, particularly if we're going to continue working on this topic another day, we might then have them in groups construct a level three question. Turn those into the teacher. We could also see if we had answered any of those questions during that learning process, but turn them into the teacher, and that could impact what the teacher de designs in the lesson for the next day. So there's a lot of different strategies you can do. And I didn't want to just go through this model lesson and say, okay, here's the two strategies we're going to use. I wanted to make connections to other ones you've been exposed to and also to try to get you to think about and realize it's choice. I could have just as easily put in KWL done the same lesson. You know, I could have pulled out and maybe not even done the photo analysis piece because I had the photos in the article. And so we could have just done some look at and talk about in your group what do you see in these pictures, then read the article and analyze the article. It's choices, and then it's what is your intent. So then how do you know which method to use? This is our final closing question, and I'm going to give you a clue because I'm going to back up to here. How as a teacher might you choose which method you were wanting to use then as you were designing that disciplinary literacy lesson? Look at your standards, because that's the starting point for your lesson anyways, and it guides what you're trying to accomplish, the purpose of the learning. So if our purpose was to work on their comprehension skills and have them move away from just the basics of, oh, look, I'm learning to read, to now reading to learn. Did we do that in this lesson? Okay. And then when we come down here, did we give students varied and meaningful ways to get in and learn to study, use inquiry skills, and recognize the importance of the, the information and the skills that they're developing. Did we do that? Okay. And then, the last two, we worked with visual images, and did they use those different images to represent meaning? And now with visual images, we have photographs, but also, when we use something that's in a format like this, this is a graphic organizer, which is also another form of vision. So this helped to make meaning as well. And then over here, higher order thinking skills. We used uh, locating of information. We analyzed, evaluated, interpreted, organized, and we used the information to talk about citizenship issues we didn't go extensively into, but we did touch about the current relevancy of this issue still and also the impact societally it would have had on people, on families with the children having to work. 
Um, and then we used a variety of sources. Electronic would have been the sources that I pulled for you guys because we didn't want to take time to do that. But do you see how we hit every single teak that I pulled out? This is also how you would choose which teak you're going to specify and use. And then what's your best match of strategy or method you use with it in your lesson? Because what is your purpose? What are you trying to instill in your students? Any questions for me that I might be able to answer? No? Okay, then thank you very much.